Well, as someone once said, there's always two sides to a story. We know there's always two sides to a coin. And the same thing may be true in this song that Paul's singing, because there's two sides to this song. Uh, the one side we looked at yesterday, where he said, if we trust him, if we, that he died for us, that we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll reign with him. But now he goes on and, and looks at the other side and says, if we disown him, he will also disown us. Uh, in fact, he continues to go on saying that uh, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. But let's look at the first part of this. If, he, if we disown him, he will disown us. Um, uh, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, writing in early 2nd century, said, The man who is afraid to suffer cannot belong to him who suffered. In other words, Tertullian is saying that suffering uh, for Christ is, is an integral part of of being in Christ. Uh, in other words, Jesus said, or excuse me, Paul said to the in 2 Timothy, he tells him later on in chapter 4, he says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what Paul was telling Timothy is that what you're seeing me go through right now is not something that's out of the normal. That what is normal for a Christian is that we're going to go through suffering because we're choosing the path less traveled. Um, in fact, we're choosing a path that for the non-Christian is feverishly, uh, feverishly avoided. I mean, they do anything in their power not to go through suffering. Now, part of that is the way that we're wired as human beings, because there are certain things that the human anatomy uh, was not created for. We weren't created for sin, first of all, that sin is like toxins to our system. So realize that Adam and Eve were created in a sinless world. They weren't created with a dynamic or a dimension that could enable them to live healthily and well within a sin environment. That's why God said, if you sin, if you violate my law, which he only had one, one rule, in his law, don't eat that fruit. If you violate that one rule, you will die. And what happened is they violated that rule. Sin became established within the world. The dominion of the earth uh, was passed on to, to Satan. And those of us who live here have come under uh, his evil dominion until we come to Christ. But to say all of that, as a result, Suffering is an integral part of that because sin produces death, it produces disease, it produces loss, it produces pain, it produces suffering. That suddenly we find ourselves living in an environment for which we were not created. And in a way, that's why I think there's strong evidence that the, 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 the human anatomy, the, the human beings, our bodies are really kind of deteriorating so that when we look in the book of Genesis, we see Adam and Eve living to be 900 years. And before long, we get to Abraham and he only lives to be 175. And then we get to Jacob and he only lives to be 110 or 120. Well, you begin to realize that lives are getting shorter, not because somebody just figured out how to keep time. They had figured that out already. They had the moon and the stars and all the rest and the sun. They knew when day began and day end. They knew how to count uh, 1 through 65, 365. So the reality is they were counting days like we counted days. And to say all of that, that they uh, realized that lives were getting shorter. So that by the time you get to Psalms, David says that a man's life is 70 years. Or if he has the veracity or maybe the tenacity, he might be able to live to be 80. But, you know, living beyond 80 is still uh, a significant accomplishment. It's, it's older than the average life expectancy of you and me or most any other people upon the planet. So it, it's interesting because lifetimes are getting shorter. And I would suggest to you it's happening because sin is toxic. And we're living in a world that creates suffering because of the toxicity of sin. And here's what even aggravates it. He said, if you desire to live a godly life, in other words, you desire to not go with the flow, but you decide that you're going to fight the current, uh, you're going to find that you're going to meet a lot more opposition, which will likely increase the degree in which you suffer in this present world. And, you know, even in this day and age we're living where we're beginning to see uh, the governmental systems and in both corporate and government and, and all these different elements of our society, education, so forth, basically militating itself and organizing itself against 
Christian philosophy, Christian theology, Christian morality, as they begin to militate against that and begin to punish people in various ways by depriving them or denying certain things that they have a right to. And we sit there and go, well, this isn't fair, this isn't right. We have to understand that even though it's not fair, it's not right, even though they may be violating the Constitution and violating your, your rights as a citizen of this country and so forth, the simple fact is it's happening because you have decided that you're going to follow Christ. It's happening because you've decided that you're not going to comply, uh, you're not going to accommodate things in your life that are contrary to the Word of God. You're going to stand true to the Lord, and that's going to bring opposition. You become a marked enemy. So when you think about a war that's going on between countries, for example, you think about the war between Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, uh, ostensibly, the war is between the armies that the Ukrainians have formed and the Russian army. But there's a whole lot of collateral damage. There's a whole lot of individual people. And I would remind you on both sides of the border. <laughs> it's happening to Ukrainians, but it's happening to Russians too. There are people who are suffering untold hardships and difficulties. I know from one of my Russian friends who's a pastor over there who's telling me that, that they're going and administering into communities uh, in Russia right now, that near that border, which I mean, they've been bombed out and are getting bombed on a regular basis. Drones flowing in and firing projectiles, blowing up homes, roads, streets, cars, all sorts of things. Because the idea is that uh, the friend of my enemy is my enemy. And so we call it collateral damage, and the military does at least. But the simple fact is people are suffering because of sin. And you find that throughout history, and even up into the present time, maybe more so today than any other time in history, there are people who are losing their life because they are Christians and they won't compromise their faith. And they're suffering for it. It's, it's more than just losing your job or getting you know, uh, bombed on, on Facebook or something. This is where you're finding yourself literally being arrested and put in jail. It, it's even happening in places like Canada, but it's certainly even happening here as well. Finding they make may other charges, they may say it's other things, but what they're doing is they're coming against not you as the individual, but they're coming against what you believe and what you speak because you believe and what they're looking for you is to be silent. And I would just tell you, if you want to uh, avoid having the enemy come against you, just stop talking, just stop living your faith, stop, stop being vocal. Go private with your Christianity and you'll find that for a while you'll, you'll be left alone. Eventually when they've corralled the culture, then they'll begin to root out those of you who have faith and then they'll give you a choice. You can deny your faith or you can pay the price that others before you who have not denied your faith. But the bottom line is that the temptation to disown him, like Peter did when he thought his life was in trouble, it's huge. It's huge. And if it can happen to a guy like Peter who had lived with Jesus for over three years, it certainly can happen to you. If you have not decided that you're not going to allow yourself to incrementally give in to the sabotage of the culture. And that's really the challenge. I think one commentator put, put something, wrote something I thought was quite good. He said, Jesus Christ cannot vouch in eternity for someone who has refused to have anything to do with him in time. He's talking about somebody who's rejected Christ. But at the same time, he adds, but he is always true to those who, however much they have failed, have tried to be true to him. So I want to be very clear that you may fail at various points. You may not live up to your calling. You may not have the courage or the, be outspoken at a time when you should be outspoken. And I don't mean it to be a point of condemnation. I mean it to be a point of correction. That when that happens and you realize as you look back, I let that opportunity go by because of fear or maybe just simply confusion or I didn't know quite how to deal with it. The answer is very simple. You just simply say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for not having the courage. And I pray that the next time I have that situation, you would give me the opportunity to speak up and I wouldn't pull back with an evil heart of unbelief. That's the key here. But when he talks about people who disown him, he's talking about people who don't want him to have any ownership in their life. And that's not talking about you, I don't believe, or me. He's talking about people who have rejected Christ. So those who reject him cannot expect him to 
vouch for them on the other side of eternity. As, as the writer put, he cannot vouch in eternity for someone who has refused to have anything to do with him in time. And that, yet at the same time, one of the things he says, and I think this is an encouragement to us, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You know, it was Balaam when he was being bribed by the king of Moab to curse Israel, who responded and simply said, you know, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So even when you and I fail in our faith, he remains faithful because that's who he is. In fact, one of the names of Jesus is faithful and trustworthy. Well, that's it for this week. Look forward to being with you again next week. God bless you and go in his grace and have a great summer.